just been reflecting, there's a lot happening in our world at the moment, um, isn't there? There's um, like white supremacists rioting on the streets in, I think it's Virginia. You've got um, <coughs> tragedies happening in, I heard some tragedies on the news this morning and it completely distracted me. Just when you hear something on news, you think, wow, how some people live. Um, there's nuclear posturing by North Korea. And um, I don't know about you, I just don't trust that man. <laughs> I don't know what's going on inside his head, but... It's concerning. Well, and there's these big macro issue, issues in our world. And then we're, we're talking this morning, uh, the message is called The Struggle is Real. And we're talking about the area of, of lust. And lust is primarily something that happens not with, um, it, it's not necessarily something that expresses itself physically, but it's something that happens in our minds. And you might think, why do you Christians always talk about things that don't matter for the world? Or why are you not focusing on the big macro issues and why are you talking about personal morality? And, and I think it's actually a really good question. But I think the teachings of Jesus would tell us that what goes on in our head and what we choose to focus on, because lust is actually corrupted desire, that we are created human beings. This is not a Christian or non-Christian thing. We are created to be um, people that desire we crave for something beyond which we have already received. So we've been created with um, healthy desires, and then there's also desires that are not healthy towards things that are not good for us, or sometimes the way or the, the means or the timing is not for our flourishing according to the Word of God. And so the thing that is important is to realise that according to Jesus, the area of lust, what happens in our, in our brain and what happens in our mind and our thinking and what we focus on, it actually does have radical consequences for our society as a whole. It has radical ramifications to your well-being in your um, relationship, in your marriage. It has radical ramifications to the health of your friendships, it has radical ramifications to the enjoyment of your season of singleness or your calling of lifelong singleness. And so these areas, I believe also the area of lust and what we do with our thinking affects our ability to experience and participate in the joy of the Lord and actually live life to the fullest. I just was reflecting on this just I, last week, one of the key take-homes from Sam Albury's message was that Jesus, whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we're attracted to the opposite sex or the same sex, he treats us all the same. I thought it was a really great take-home. He treats us all the same. And he tells us that if we want to be his followers, we need to take up our cross, we need to deny ourselves and follow him. I think it's pretty powerful. Sorry, I just I bookmarked it and now I've lost it. There we go. Mark 8, verse 34. He turned to the crowds with him, with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And so that is true for married people and single people. doesn't matter who you're attracted to. You are called to deny yourself, saying the most important person in the world is me, and to say, I am living for Christ and his pursuit. And that is a, it's, it's a challenging thing. It's radical and costly discipleship, but it's the same for everyone. And I think the other thing we have to remember with Jesus is, in Matthew 6.33, he says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the other things of life, the needs that you have, the most fundamental human needs will be added to you. So any needs you have, physical, material, spiritual, they will be met in God if you put him first. Matthew 6, 33. Math, uh, John 10, 10. The enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life in all of its fullness. And so I would hope that most of us here as followers of Christ are saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus. We are people that are saying, I believe that Jesus is true to his word. I believe that Jesus can be trusted. 
that he has come not to steal and destroy, but to give me life in its fullness. And that concept and that experience of life is going to look different to me doing things in my way, in my time, without denying myself. So this is a serious thing and it does affect our relationships. I think it's also, James says it well, James the brother of Jesus in James chapter 1 says this, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So what that tells me is that there's desire that's good in you, and then there's desire that has been corrupted and that's broken and that is distorted and is not, uh, that it's desire not as it is intended according to God's created purpose. It shouldn't be news to us that within you and I, we have some good desires and we have some desires that aren't that healthy, that aren't for our flourishing and the flourishing of others and aren't in accordance with placing God first in our lives. And so these desires, it says then, verse 15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. So what it's saying is that actually there are temptations in our life, there are desires in our life that they don't stay as desires, they actually lead to other things. They give birth to other things in our life. They give birth, so, so the problem with most of us in this room, myself and you included, is not our behaviours, it's our beliefs. It's not um, choosing to get up in the morning saying, I want to hurt someone, I want to abuse someone. It's actually stuff that's deeper, it's got to do with our beliefs it's got to do with our values it's got to do with what we love and what we hate those things shape our behaviors more than we know and so sometimes someone might say well no no I haven't I haven't you know cheated on my wife but because of the area of desire in our life we are heading down a path where that may be an inevitability I haven't you know um, committed fraud in my work but maybe you're blurring the lines at fraud in your work and you're on a path that is destructive. Maybe you're on a path of just compromising in the area of your life and not putting God as number one. And you might not have thrown away your faith, but you might be on a road where you just inevitably you'll say, you know what, God is irrelevant in my life. You know what, I don't want to be a Christian. You know what, I don't even believe in God. It's amazing how generally people, the thing that precedes people not believing in God, is people saying, I don't want to follow Christ anymore. Because being a follower of Jesus is hard. And so when being a follower of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus is hard, then we say, wow, okay, I'm not sure I even believe in God because I can choose to believe what I want to believe. It doesn't make God true or not true. It's just amazing how much these things shape, our, how beliefs shape our actions and our actions shape our beliefs. So Jesus... Um, in typical Jesus fashion, teaches on this subject in a very non-confrontational way. Don't you love Jesus? Let's have a look at what he has to say in, on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever told. Matthew 5. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And this is the point as a teenager that I just walked out of the room. I'm just like, I'm done. <laughs> Has anyone seen that Seinfeld episode? A few of you got that joke. Um, <laughs> but it was like, I just, I just looked at that scripture and I just thought, I can't do that. Um, apparently, I'm just a heart adulterer and I just need to keep on reading. And maybe one day in five years' time, I'll reinterpret this passage. Because how many people know when you start reading the Bible, there's a lot of weird stuff and you just keep on reading. But you feel good. Yeah, I read a whole chapter today. Yes. Didn't understand half of it, but I kept on reading. Actually, the more I'm an experienced follower of Jesus, the more I realize I don't understand. And the more I realize I have to go slower in my reading, not faster. And it's good to ask questions and just to sometimes acknowledge you don't understand it all. Anyway. This passage, yeah, that just undid me. And then it goes on to say, just if that's not clear enough, if you look at someone with lust 
in your heart. You've already committed adultery with them in your heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. The early um, church fathers interpreted this as Jesus speaking very seriously but not literally. Okay, very seriously. He was really talking about the heart of the issue. The heart of the Mosaic law was not just that the action of adultery is sinful, but there's actually something deeper going on in the human heart. Okay. And so what he's not saying is that if you've committed adultery in your heart, if you've had lust towards someone that's not your marriage covenantal partner, then you may as well just go on and commit adultery because you've already done it in your heart. And it's all the same. No. In fact, not all sin has the same consequences. But what Jesus is saying is that if you're having lust in your mind and in your heart towards someone, that's wrong. That's sin. And it shouldn't be minimised. And it can actually give birth to other sin, the actual sin of physical adultery as well. And there's a lot of us in this room that might morally posture about all the things we're not. I've never killed anyone. You know, you know, you're really bad when it's not like I've killed anyone. It's not like you know. Uh, <laughs> it's like when my parents used to complain to me as a teenager, and I'd be, "Mum, it's not like I'm, you know, doing drugs like the other teenagers out there. You should be glad that you've got me, because, <laughs> because it, you know how we always like to compare ourselves to people that are worse than us in our own imagination. Anyway, that's what I used to do back in the olden days. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, But I think that's what we do. We like to set up these straw people that we compare ourselves to and we say, thank God I'm not like them. And we we become Pharisees. And so we do that with sexual ethics. We were like, oh, look at those people out there and look at those sinners or look at that person that left the church. And Jesus would come in here and he'd say, so I love you, but let's just be honest about what's going on in the heart. And let's be serious about the damaging effects that that has in your relationships, the damaging effects that that has for your ability to follow me. Remember when I was like 18, 19, 20, we'd go to church on Sunday and we'd go to the beach straight after church. I grew up in the Southern Shire in Sydney and we'd go to Cronulla Beach and in summertime the women don't wear a lot of clothes at Cronulla which is very unhelpful for young men like myself back in the day. Thank God I don't struggle with that anymore. Um, but, <laughs> but I remember we'd go from church to the beach and then we'd get out of the car and we'd have a little pep talk and we'd be, all right, guys, you ready? And then we'd run to the beach and we would run with our heads down like this. <laughs> Because there's some like, it's too many people that don't want tan lines, if you know what I mean. And <laughs> you're allowed to laugh in church. Some of you are like, am I allowed to laugh at that? Um, okay, anyway, and, and so like the, the problem is, we've just come straight from church, worship and word environment, and we go there and you just see guys, you know, all of a sudden just drifting, you know, when they're running down to the beach. And it's like, no, keep your head down. It's like horses with blinkers, you know. Um, and it's just, I don't want to make it out that it's like a bad sin. Or it just shows how this is kind of, this is real life. This is all around us. And as a young man, it was really challenging. I was a really committed Christian, but this is a real challenge. I remember um, when I was, used to work in the city of Sydney, I just, I'd be finished work, I'd be tired at the end of the day. I was a full-on Christian. And I'd just be, like, I remember there was this girl that used to catch the train with me. And I had to move carriages because I would just, my mind would start playing tricks on me and saying just lustful thoughts towards this really, really attractive woman that wasn't my wife. I was single. I don't think I'd even met Nikki back then. So she doesn't have to be jealous about what I'm saying. (laughs) But I remember just coming to a point of saying, this is really hard because I want to follow Jesus, but... I just can't, and I had to, and I, so I started positioning myself different locations on the train station and catching a different carriage. But this girl was way too distracting, and she did not 
dress in a way that helped me at that time. But that was not her problem, that was my problem. Okay, I feel better just confessing my sins to you. <laughs> Why don't we all have a time of confession? Um, and you know, you don't realise the damage of lust until it comes time to kind of have a detox, okay? So if, if lust is corrupted desire, one of the things I lust about the most, and I think many of us in our society do, is food. And I, I think lust is the true best word for it. Craving and lusting after food. And we, we live in a society where we are conditioned to being immediately gratified. We have drive through takeaway. We have drive through bottle shops. I mean, South Australia, the home of the drive through bottle shop. So, you know, you're driving home and you want to drink. You don't even have to get out the car. Praise God for South Australia. I mean, we have made it so easy for immediate gratification. And so we feed the flesh and we lust after food. We think about food and we go and get it. Some of you still live at home with your mums. And you know what that's like. Mum, can I have this? And she makes it for you. Some of you, not looking at anyone in particular. But this is a dangerous thing. And do you know, the only time you realise how much you lust after food and you think about it is when you fast from it. And you actually chop it off. And you realise, oh man, I think about food a lot. And I actually feel entitled to food. And food and drink when I want it. And so some of us, we have a lust for attention. Some of us, we have a lust for power. And there's things that unhealthy desires that drive us. And it's not until we detox from it that we realise, wow, this has got a hold of my life. It's got a hold of my attention. It's got a hold of my energy. It's actually diminishing my relationships. So, are we all convinced that this is an issue for us? <laughs> Praise God. Can always guarantee a quiet room when you speak on this stuff. What can we do when we're struggling with lust? Not if, but when. First thing is run. Run, Forrest, run. Get out of there. 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee the evil desires of youth. And I would add middle age and old age. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, I believe that when we're struggling with lust, sometimes the first action needs to be not, yeah, she'll be right, mate. Yeah, I can handle this. It's actually saying, you know what? I can't handle this right now. I'm not strong enough in this friendship because I'm being tempted and I'm fantasizing about this relationship in an unhealthy way. I'm obsessing about this person in an unhealthy way. I'm not in control of my computer use. So I actually have to just not have the internet. I remember when we moved when we were moving from Melbourne to Adelaide, I just said to Nikki for a period of time, I I don't want to get the internet connected to our house because it's just too much temptation. Because when you've got a wife that travels for three, four months of the year and you're a young man, like it's just, I'm a fully devoted follower of Jesus and the challenge and the lure of internet pornography, sometimes we just have to say, I can't fight that and I need to disconnect from the internet. Okay, so it's really hard. Now, the problem is, now all of us have got one of these. And so many searches in our community and even people in this room are for pornography on their personal devices. Men predominantly, but also women. And I think we're fooling ourselves if we think that this, and the stats just don't say that this is a non-Christian secular issue. This is a, a human issue. It's like if you could go back a generation ago and, and, and say, how would a young teenage boy go if he set up his bedroom in a news agency with no other people around? I mean, I remember as a young kid walking into the news agency and you've got this peer pressure. You've got the, 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 the dude behind the counter and he's watching you. 
<laughs> and you've got like other people walking around. And I mean, now people have access to a news agency with no accountability. And, you know, who am I to judge? Because this is something that so many of us struggle with in this room. And we, I think we just need to acknowledge it's really hard for young people. And as I say to Pastor Bill, he said, yep, yeah, young people, we, we, he said, yep, yeah, young people need to hear this. And I said, Bill, it's all people in this church. Some of you are in your 50s. Some of you are in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 30s, 40s. This is not something that discriminates. And... There's some, some amazing research coming out about the dangers of pornography upon the brain. I just read this article the other day about 15 scientifically explained reasons why porn isn't healthy for viewing. And uh, it's by an organisation called Fight the New Drug. Is anyone familiar with that? Um, it's, it's an awesome website. I would actually recommend, if you want to read some good articles on the, the effects of pornography upon society and how it's affecting relationships in an unhealthy way, um, check it out. Fight the new drug, um, or even like it on Facebook and check it out. Um, oh, these are some things that it's happening in our society, or the, the effects of porn. This is not from a religious perspective necessarily. This is just for all people. Number one, porn can change and rewire your brain. Number two, a porn habit can escalate into twisted territory. So more and more what people are looking for is becoming more and more twisted and distorted and disturbing. Um, porn is highly addictive, far more addictive than any other online um, habit. And the levels of dopamine that are pumping into your, you know, into your body and the, the, the hit that people get through consuming pornography, it's kind of like it's setting people up for an incredible... Well, first of all, it gives the, our brain the illusion of joy and pleasure. So we're getting a dopamine hit, but we're not getting any reward. And so it leads to high levels of depression and despair, and also a whole range of other things, but highly addictive. Um, heaps more addictive than like online gambling and things like that. It affects um, what people are into, like in terms of their sexual lives. It can, it affects people, so more and more people are having to go to therapists because they're unable to have intimacy within their marriages. Um, it's also full of lies about what true sexuality is all about. It damages, um, our, it, it damages love and relationships. It can leave you lonely. Ultimately, pornography, it's not just about sex. It's actually about escaping reality. It's about... And, and so... so it actually isolates people because it's not something people want to talk about. Um, it can hurt your partner and it can warp your healthy view of sex. It has an inseparable, inseparable link to prostitution and sex trafficking. In fact, the numbers of people that have actually viewed, um, even children, the rates of children that have viewed child pornography in our society is very high. Like it's, I think it's over 20%. So. Um, it's, it's an ugly world that you're engaging with when you consume pornography. And it can seriously hurt your family, personal life. It's connected with violence. So the levels of violence out there. You know, in a world where violence against women is seen as the worst crime, and rightly so, there's terrible violence against women in porn. And uh, so anyway, look, these are just some things that are all around in our society. And I think with a lot of the areas that people struggle, we have to run away from them. Some people are not strong enough to fight and have to run. That's why I love this scripture. It says, flee from whatever's going to stir up lust. There are times when you have to get out of the room. I remember as a teenager getting together with all my Christian school buddies and my mate whipped out the porno and he put it in and it was just like, okay, am I going to be the Nigel No Friends? And am I going to walk out or am I just going to sit at the back and just with a cheesy grin on my face. And I remember walking out of the room with a bunch of my Christian mates and they just like, oh, you think you're so holy. You think you're better than us. And let me tell you, it was really hard. And that was, I reckon, as a 16-year-old. And there's lots of times in my life where I haven't done the right thing, but sometimes the courageous thing is to say, I need to get out of here. I need to get out of this relationship. I need to get out of this friendship. I need to get out of this friendship with this woman or this man that's not my wife or my husband. Sometimes we don't just need to change our behaviour, we need to change our environment. 
Number two, fight. So we run and then we fight. And when you're fighting, you fight with the left and the right. Now the left jab is the word no. You need to say no. I reckon we need to get better as individuals and as a church of saying this, in Jesus' name. Can you say that? In Jesus' name. I think we need to get better in fighting and saying, in Jesus' name, no. In Jesus' name, I will not entertain that thought in my head any longer. In Jesus' name, I will not go there. In Jesus' name, I'm not going to entertain this anymore in my thinking because I know that it's going to be toxic in the long term, even if I want to think about it. In Jesus' name, no. In Jesus' name, I want to view something illicit on the internet. In Jesus' name, no. But how many of us know that just saying no is not good enough? (laughs) Because it's kind of like, to use the food analogy, it's kind of like putting me in a bakery. (laughs) It's kind of like me in the middle of a fast going down to my favourite coffee shop, third time lucky, and and I'm fasting not just from food but from coffee which is just, uh, uh, yeah, for me, if I fast from coffee, I may as well fast from food. It's just kind of like, it's going to be miserable anyway. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? And, and I'm there and I smell the coffee beans and then the barista, he just says, hey man, do you want a coffee? <laughs> and then the dude from our back comes out with a fresh batch of donuts. <laughs> and they're fresh, they're not like doughy. They're kind of like, the, the texture is just amazing. Isn't that right, Gannett? And they just like melt in your mouth. And, and it would be wrong to say no. Because there are people in other countries that are starving and they would love to be in this environment. And Jesus came to give me life and life in all of its fullness. Can I get an amen? So what kind of God would want to say no to me having coffees and donuts? For freedom, Christ has set me free not to be under the burden and the yoke of legalism. So I'm going to take that donut and I'm going to take that coffee for the glory of God. You see? So I'm there and I'm looking at the donut and I'm looking at the coffee and I'm saying, no, no, I'm not going. In Jesus' name, get behind thee, Satan. In Jesus' name, coffee. Turn into water. <laughs> You know, like, it's just, it doesn't work. Let me tell you. It is inevitable that Tim Lockins will eat that donut and drink that coffee. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, no is not enough. It's like looking at the line saying, yep, that's a really bad line. Yep, I'm not going to follow that line. Yep, 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 yep. Because what the scripture says that I read before, it said flee from anything that stimulates or stirs up youthful lust. But it also tells us what we need to pursue. And if we just are focusing on what we're not meant to do, we actually forget that we're actually meant to focus on not just the no, but the yes. And what is the yes? I don't think it's a principle. I don't think it's a promise. I think the yes is a person that we need to fix out our mind on. And his name is Jesus. In Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. How many people know that being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean the sin falls off you. It means that there are times when with the Spirit's help, you have to throw off those things that entangles you. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. It's not a 100 metre Usain Bolt sprint. It is a marathon and we need to run with perseverance and you can only run with perseverance if you have purpose of where you're heading. And if you have purpose of where you're heading and you know why you're running and you know where you're running and you know what's at the goal, you have to make sure you know what you're fixing your eyes on. You, know, you have a vision of the future that produces passion in your struggle. And that vision is Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him. 
he endured the cross. And so when we are being tempted, not if, when, when we are struggling in the area of lust, we are actually called to focus on Jesus, not just a God that gives us laws, but a God that has come to earth, a God that has said, I love you so much. You are worth more than what you're thinking. You are worth more than what you're about to do. I love you so much I have better for you. Will you trust me? The God that for the joy set before him endured the cross and it says that we need to fix our eyes on him, fixate on Jesus. And so we need to pray and we need to worship. I find when you're being tempted or when you're struggling in the area of your thought life, it's not enough to say don't do that. You actually have to replace that thought with something else, a greater, more worthy and a more superior thought. You need to ask God to say, God, give me a picture of what is beautiful what is true, what is real, what is eternal. Fill my mind with things that glorify you and are going to help me. God, give me a vision of you. Give me a vision of Jesus. And so we need to actually become worshippers. And this is what we were talking about last week, no, two weeks ago. We need to be 24-7 worshippers. We need to be able to worship on the train. We need to be able to worship while we're driving in the car. We need to be able to worship when we're uh, distracted by that thing or that thought. We need to be able to worship God. We need to be able to pray in the Spirit. We need to be able to pray in English. We need to be able to pray with groans too deep for words. We need to even complain. Complain in prayer, because that's what we read about in the book of Psalms. Complain and anguish and struggle. And, but, but when people call out to God, there's something that happens. They're not calling to themselves. They're calling to God. You see, the, 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 the goal of life is not to find meaning and identity within. It's actually to say, God, I need to find truth and beauty and meaning outside of myself in you. And so I'm going to give you my complaints. I'm going to give you my challenges. I'm going to give you my temptations. And I'm going to trust that you are not going to just tweak me on the outside, you're going to change the orientation of my heart. And I think in this whole area of sexuality, we are fixated upon sexual orientation and sexual choice, but God is not as concerned about that as the orientation of our heart towards Him. But if our orientation of our heart towards Him, we will realise that we need to, all of us, lay down our lives. We need to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Him. And that is really hard, but with the Spirit's help, we can do it. Run, fight, pursue. Can everyone just say that word, pursue? Pursue. I think this is really important because one of the areas where the enemy has a field day, is when we have too much time on our hands. As an old, experienced youth pastor from many years back, who's now retired due to old age, I used to always get prepared for the long, hot summer where young people have too much time on their hands. Can I hear an amen, Pastor Sam? And it's just like, it just gets silly. And, you know, during the year when people have uni assignments and they have work and they have structure and they have meetings it's like there's a purpose there's a rhythm to my life and then all of a sudden bedtime becomes 3 a.m and then wake up time becomes 12 noon and people spend too much time with one another and it just kind of becomes this lethargic lackadaisical lack of and, and, and you see problems in relationships in summer You see problems with people focusing on the wrong things, people getting distracted. I think as human beings, we're not called. We're called to rest, but we're not called to be idle. We're called to be purposeful. I think we need to not be idle, but active in kingdom mission, active in our vocation, giving our best for the glory of God, active in cultivating friendships and healthy relationships. Because if we're not active in healthy, constructive ways, we will get active in self-fulfilling ways. And that's what lust is. It's saying, how can I get immediate gratification? How can I gratify the flesh in a way that I don't have to have a relationship, the messiness of friendships, the messiness of marital covenantal relationship? How can I have the benefits without the pain? (laughs) But the problem is you'll never get intimacy from lust. So pursue. Listen to this, Proverbs 13.4. A sluggard's appetite. Isn't that a good word? I want to bring that word back. A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. The interesting thing about the sluggard, the sluggard probably eats a lot more and consumes a lot more than the diligent, but is never fulfilled. A sluggard's appetite is never fulfilled, but the diligent 
are satisfied. Romans 12, 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. I'm 35 and I want to be one of those random old guys that is more passionate about Jesus in my 80s or 90s than I am today. Do you know what? In this church, we have wonderful, senior, godly men and women that are more passionate about Jesus than when they were teenagers and when they were young adults. But that is the exception and not the rule. More often than not, I see people taper off their faith. And this is not just elderly people, this is middle-aged people. This is young adults. I know some young adults that are more old in their thinking than elderly people. More conservative and more boring as young adults. And it's meant to be like an exciting time of life. Anyway, I get frustrated. Never be lacking in zeal. You have been created to be a human being with desires, with a fire in your belly, to actually live for something, to give for something, to be a man or woman of purpose. Don't just drift through life. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. You see, some of us, we, our brain is a battlefield. And, and Ephesians says that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but there's a spiritual warfare going on for our thinking. And some of us, we're so obsessed with just trying to right the wrongs in our brain and just trying to change the way we think. And we need to start getting active in doing what God's called us to do. Because we've got too much time on our hands. We're idle. We're not pursuing what He's called us to do. I want to finish with some quotes by a guy that generally says it better than me. His name's C.S. Lewis. And in his famous book, The Screwtape Letters, where there's a conversation from one older demon to a young, I think his nephew, demon, about the ways of deceiving humanity. This is what he says about God. He, God, made the pleasures. All of our demon research so far has not enabled us to produce one pleasure. All we can do is encourage the humans to take the pleasures from our enemy that it, which our enemy has produced at times or in ways or to degrees which he has forbidden. What he's saying is the, st- the chief strategy of the enemy is to distort and con- taught and to confuse the good desires that God has for you. To tip them on their head, to distort them from their intended purpose and to take a good thing and to make it a hurtful or a painful or an evil thing. Another C.S. Lewis quote from his book, The Weight of Glory, that I've read many times. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You see, to be a Christian is not to be a wowser and not to be someone that's scared of pleasure and aesthetics and beauty and the good things of life. To be a Christian is to understand that truth, beauty, goodness, pleasure come from God and that we will never be satisfied unless we connect the good things in this life with the good gift giver. And so God has created you to be a man or woman of desire, of passion, of pursuit, of intimacy, of friendship, of sacrificial giving, not of self-gratification, not of being caught up with the lusts of the flesh that would actually diminish our capacity to love and to give. I want to finish by reading this Psalm 37 verses 1 to 7. I think it's a really good way to finish. And then we're going to have communion together and seal this time. Let me read it to you. You might want to close your eyes. Psalm 37, 1 to 7. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. 
Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Thank you, Lord. Just join with me as we pray.